This is Unsilo brought to you by Alumni FM, connecting people through stories. Welcome to Unsilo. This is Greg LeBlanc. I'm here today with Thomas Erickson, who is the author of, well, a whole bunch of books. Probably the, the most famous was your first book, which is Surrounded by Idiots, right? Which, you know, as soon as I saw that, I had to run out and buy that one because, you know, I, I identified. But you've published a whole bunch of other books that draw on the same pool of insight, including Surrounded by Psychopaths. You've got another one called Surrounded by Narcissists, which I don't have with me. Surrounded by Bad Bosses. Surrounded by Setbacks. And the book coming out this year is going to be Surrounded by Energy Vampires. Welcome, Thomas. Thank you so much. Well, I mean, I think you, you definitely have a knack for marketing and <laughs> sales. And I think your earliest career was in sales and you were pretty good at it, as it's pretty obvious. And I think when people come to these books, they probably are attracted for the same reason why I am, which is I think, oh, yeah, you know, I look around and I see a bunch of people that you know, I have trouble dealing with. But I think that the magic of the book is that it really forces you to see that maybe you're the idiot, <laughs> Right. In a way, kind of helps you to realize that, mm. you know, your dismissive attitude towards others, towards your coworkers and the folks who work for you, you work for, may simply be driven by a type of misunderstanding. Now, I think in the later books, you actually do dig into some people that we might call toxic, and we can sort of try and distinguish between what makes someone really toxic and just simply difficult for you to understand. But I guess, you know, I wanted to start off by asking you, because you started in business and then you went into consulting and writing, and now you kind of run a business because you have a bunch of people that work for you. Can you talk a bit about your early experiences? Because I think you describe in, in one of the books how you very early on realized that, you know, there was some growth that you had to do in order for you to become a more effective leader. Absolutely. Sure. Uh, well, I was a good sales guy as a young man. As you said, I, I come from sales. That's my background. I love selling. I love doing business. I am a sort of an entrepreneurial selling kind of person or maybe a selling entrepreneur or whatever you like to use as a definition. But when I was 24, I filed for my first managing position and I thought that was kind of the same you know, selling, leading, you know, what could possibly go wrong. So I sold myself to these people. This was in the banking industry. They took me for some reason. They hired me and said, this guy, this young fellow, here, he looks like he's going to be able to do the job. Let's bring him on and, and see what's going to happen. And I, I, I severely messed it up. I totally, I could give you so many really horrible examples of how I messed it up. Anything that happened, I just said, well, fix it. Well, what about this? Well, fix it. Well, what about that? Well, fix it, fix it. I, I, I really didn't know because nobody told me this is a different position. These are very different challenges, you know, leading and selling, selling, using other kind of people, making other people sell. It's not the same thing as selling yourself, which sounds kind of silly now of life later. But the thing was, I, I even actually went to my manager's manager two levels up and said, you have to take me out because I don't know what I'm up to here. And he said, you better stay put, Sonny, because your manager, she's even worse. She's not even here. So, but after a year, 11 months, something, I managed to sort of get myself out of this equation. You know, when you sit around a coffee table, you sit there, you know, and they, they have a little gift for you and good luck in the next step in your career and bye-bye. And they didn't give me anything. <laughs> I gave them a plant and I said, I, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry, this was bad. And some lady felt bad for me and she said, got a little bit better at the end, kind of, sort of. And then my, my, the, the HR department called me up and they said, would you like to take a personality test? And I said, sure, why? Well, let's come, come in here and, and we will help you with this. And they, I also a couple of, answered a couple of questions and they gave me this questionnaire and I, they gave me this report, handed it over to me and said, could you please read it? And I did. And I said, this is horrible. This is me. Is this what people see when they meet? And they said, oh, yes. Would you like to talk about it? And I said, I better do that. This was the first encounter for me with, let's call it self-awareness. Let's call it. Because I had never, ever reflected on things such as people's skills or self-awareness. I was just, you know, 
I was just Thomas. I was just me. This was a brutal awakening. It was not my big aha moment. It was more of my oh no moment. Mm -hmm. This is really bad. And they said, you have something to work on here, buddy. We could help you with this. And I, I, I did a lot of work on myself. I still am. This is 30 years ago, even, even more. And I'm still learning more things about myself ever since. And for me, it was brutal, but it was useful and beneficial. I don't know where I would have been without this really, you know, banging my head to the wall for this year and trying to fix things that I didn't know anything about. So I'm kind of happy for the experience, experience even though it hurt, it really hurt them. Uh, but it put me on track on, on working with things such as behavioral types and personalities and understanding why people are so strange, why we feel we are surrounded by idiots, because that's feeling everybody recognizes it, right? Yeah, it's interesting that they gave you a, a personality test. I mean, personality tests, they are popular in both employment settings and also in academic settings. So, you know, at the business school where I teach, we'll frequently have our students take these personality tests. And it's usually administered by the career management group. Now, my academic colleagues are very skeptical, right? So there's always this back and forth where my colleagues in organizational behavior are like, why are the career management people giving them these tests? And they give them Myers-Briggs test, right? And why are they giving them this test when this test doesn't have any academic respectability and so forth? And, and yet in, in the classes that we teach in organizational behavior, I mean, they are centered around this idea of kind of know yourself and know others. Do you think that the, that Understanding yourself is kind of a prerequisite for understanding others, or is it the only way to really understand yourself is to kind of practice the understanding of others? You go back to this thing called the Johari window. I think it reappears frequently in your book. And, and I think this is just such an important concept. You know, in order for you to discover yourself, you have to understand the perspective that you take when you're looking at others, right? So that you can understand how others see you. Exactly. That's, that's a good point. I don't think, I mean, there, there's uh, many ways to answer these questions. And a lot of people are skeptical and even critical and, and uh, really uh, angry that those tests are out there at all. And I, I fully understand if you have a strong scientific background, you need more proof. I have great respect for this. And I have a great respect for people who do work with behavioral science and who try to put things together. Uh, the, the challenge with the DISC profile or MBTI or, or and even the big five theory is actually that it hasn't gone through the university layers, so to speak. It, it, hasn't, it doesn't come from that hierarchy, which makes it a bit troublesome for people, for, for university professors. I understand their doubts. I fully do. What I do think we need to also try to wrap our head around is if it's helping to understand some sort of a basic, some sort of fundamental thing about yourself even though it might not be as precise as you would like it to be. Of course, it would be better if you could describe somebody 100% accurately. I don't think that's possible. For me, it's okay to understand the differences between, well, introversion, extroversion, that's one example, task orientation, the people orientation, just take some easy thing to, 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 to mention there. And if you do that and you add on top of that what motivates you about your driving forces and so on, then you will get to know pretty much about yourself. I could have written about any tool on the market because again, I work on the market. So I need, I needed to write something about, I needed to write about something that people could easily grasp, easy, easy understand. And I don't write for university professors, no offense. I write for the public and to make people curious and sort of drag them into this at all. I need to start on a level that make people curious and, and sort of eager to learn more. What I would, would uh, advocate is to read another book and another book and dig deep into the topic itself and take a more advanced class. Absolutely. The more you can learn about yourself, the better. Because I think actually the way to understand other people is to get to know yourself. And not in this sort of blurry fashion and you know, on a sort of uh, hallelujah thing, get to know yourself, you know. But you can go back to the old Greek and see, know thyself, you know, it has a meaning, it has a true meaning. And as most people are interested in themselves, that journey can make you more interested in other people as well, because we are kind of egotistic when it comes to where we spend our time and where we put our money. Mm -hmm. That is just the, the way it is. 
I think self-awareness is the key to social competence, social skills, people skills, whatever you like to call it. It's, it's like a journey. If I'm going to Stanford and I say, I, I call my travel agency up, let's say, not that we do that anymore, but let's say for the sake of argument, I want to go to California. And they said, no problem. We can fix you the ticket from where would you like to go? Just imagine. I said, never mind that. Don't be so problem focused. Just get me the damn ticket. How would they solve it? Also, they won't solve it. They need to dot on the map to, to, come, to sort of bind them together. They need a starting point and they need a destination. The starting point will always be me in any conversation, in any communication. Is it physical or, or verbal or, or whatever? I need to know where I'm coming from. Because if I'm meeting you and I interpret you as uh, this and that, and then I need to understand, okay, this guy's talking and working in this pace, let's say. Should I, in order to adapt to it, should I speed up or should I slow down? Well, it depends on my own pace. If I don't know which pace that is, I'm lost. So I think I really need to understand where I am. That would be my take on it. Yeah, I was speaking to Tom Gilovich recently about the illusion of objectivity, right? So every driver <laughs> thinks that they're driving at the optimal speed, right? And so, you know, so, they do. You know, That's everyone, a good everyone, point. That's a good everyone point. Who's, <laughs> everyone who's faster than you is too fast, and everyone who's slower than you is, is too slow. Yeah, yeah but, um, that's true. But these primary colors, right? I mean, this idea of the, you know, the four humors, Right. goes back a, a long time. And actually, I think it was in one of the books you pointed to, I guess it was like an Aztec approach to personality. I guess they wouldn't call it personality, but, you know, humors that also kind of overlapped with the ancient Greek approach. But the modern manifestation of this comes from this guy named William Moulton Marston. Now, I had never heard of this guy. You know, I'd heard of Meyer and Briggs and so forth. I'd never heard of this guy. Could you tell us a bit about, first of all, you know, who was he? How did he come up with this approach? And then how did you discover it? I mean, did the personality test that you were required to take at the bank, was that a DISC test or was that a different test? How did you gravitate towards this DISC approach? Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, William Walter Morstom was a psychologist. And again, to anyone who's listening, he has been questioned. I'm fully aware of that. He was sort of a Renaissance man. He also, he created the uh, Wonder Woman, if you didn't know. <laughs> no. He also, he also invented the lie detector. He, that, oh, right. Hence the Renaissance man thing there. He was kind of all over the place. And he was also working with things that I really don't understand and that, uh, that I should stay away from. And he produced this. He made a lot of studies on personalities, on behaviors. Now, to the protocol. A DISC assessment is not a personality test. It is a behavioral assessment, which is maybe uh, on a theoretical level. A test will give you a good, bad, right, wrong, or something, black and white. This is more of a description. It's an analysis. And it, sometimes it raises more questions. That is, again, the case. And it will never, ever describe a person 100%, maybe 75%, 80%. So we need to use any of these tools in the, the proper way and not sort of pay too much attention to them on all level of all the detail, all on the level of all detail. You, you need to sort of have a sort of a, what should I say? How should I call it? You need sort of a generous understanding of the exactness it isn't 100%. But again, it will raise questions. It will make you understand things and it will make you want to dig deeper into yourself. What I was given at this bank 30 years ago was probably not a DISC analysis. It was probably something different, probably something simpler, I would say. But still, it taught me important things about me and it put me on track. I need to understand more about me. I need to work on myself. I actually need to pay attention to what I'm doing because, again, I was messing things up. Uh, I stumbled onto the disk profile. I mean, it turned into the vector analysis somewhere in mid fifties, I think. And all these profiles are based on the vector analysis by Clark, another American guy. I used this the first time late nineties in this bank. And then I went into management consulting and we had a couple of different disk analysis uh, in our portfolio. And that's where I started to, to using it and using it into the, in the corporate world. 
uh, educating people, training, giving uh, workshops and so on, and, and, and teaching people this, sales people, leaders, managers, and so on. And the books around by Edith came from the notion, maybe I should tell, you know, the public about this, the ones who can't pay $200 for an analysis, who can't sort of take a class and, and pay for expensive management consultants. Maybe this is useful, you know, in general. So I went to my then publisher because I was publishing crime novels before, actually right. as a side business, because I love, I love writing. So, and I went to my then publisher, I, I had published uh, six uh, crime novels actually before. And then I said, let's write a book about behaviors, shall we? It's going to be about four colors. The colors are there for pedagogical reasons. It's easy to remember red, yellow behavior, behavior instead of a high D or an I with a low C or an ENTJ personality or an INTF or ITP. What is it? Anyways, red and yellow. There it is. It's kind of easy to wrap your head around. And I went to my publisher and said, it's going to be great. It's going to be called Surrounded by Idiots. And this is the, what it's going to look like, you know, because the, the cover of the book, it's my own design. And they said, they looked at me with horror in their eyes. And they said, actually, this is the worst idea we have ever heard about. It's really silly. Scrap the whole thing. Go back to writing crime. I said, no, 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 this is good. They say, firstly, it's a stupid title. People are going to get angry. It's an ugly cover. Don't do it. So I was shopping around and Sweden is a small country, you know, but we had 20 publishers worth looking into. So I called them all up and I presented my idea full of enthusiasm. And they all said the same thing. <laughs> Basically, I was the idiot. That was the main in their, their message. And I have never been good at taking feedback from people I don't trust. So I published the book anyway. I wrote it while commuting on the train, 15 minutes here, two, two, two hours there. And I had to self-publish it, finance everything. Nobody, believed. everybody said it's really stupid. And I was driving around with boxes in the back of my car, forcing the books onto my clients. Take 10 books. And they looked at the cover and said, what is this? Take five, two, take a book. Oh, do we have to pay for it? That's where it started. Mm -hmm. Now it's translated into 55 languages. And not to impress you, but to impress upon you, the content of the book obviously resonates with people all over the globe. That is my great takeaway. Why do people from India have the same questions as people from the States or Canada or Argentina or New Zealand or Norway or Poland? They have the same reflections, the same comments, which for me is fantastic. That is the main reason why I can live with the understanding it is not 100% ironclad when it comes to the science behind. I understand that. But for me, it is opening doors between people in a way I didn't know. I did not know people were kind of the same in Japan as they are in Sweden. I did not know that. I know it now and I am fascinated by it. Right. I was interviewing another author who is a literature professor who's written on Freud. And, you know, he, he says, the ego, the superego, right, and the id, you know, these are part of our modern mythology and they're incredibly powerful tools. And whether or not they have the same level of support as what we can get when we look at, say, you know, endocrinological responses and so forth is somewhat less relevant. If they illustrate, if they help us to understand each other, then that's what matters. But I wanted to ask you another question, which is that you have this background as a novelist. And, you know, a lot of people would argue that literature helps you to understand other people, right? And when you immerse yourself with literature, it gives you that perspective, right? It allows you to experience other people's interiority. It allows you to kind of correlate the interiority with the behavior. Do you think that your experience as a novelist has helped you to understand other people better by forcing you to imagine other people's worlds? That is, of course, the right question. Well, a bit, I would say. I also think it's kind of, in my case, the other way around. Being a novelist helped me write surrounded by it is in a way that people could sort of, they could force themselves through all the 300 pages because I know how to build a story. 
I'm not going to brag about it, but storytelling is important when it comes to learning new stuff. You need storytelling. You need anecdotes. You need a bit of irony, maybe even some, some straight out humor. You need to make people laugh, make people think. And as a novelist, that is your job to make people engage, to, to stir them up emotionally. And that is what I'm doing in my popular science books, let's call them. Uh, that helped a lot. What fascinates me with writing books in general is I have to dig down into people's psyches. I need to see what I can find. I mean, okay, I'm, I'm creating a villain here or, or the hero or, or the protagonist or whatever you want to call it. Who should I have as a role model? You, you have somebody in mind, right? You have, you think of somebody. Some people say, well, all the heroes are usually the writer's own alter ego. Well, a little bit. That is in a way true. But still, you know, I can't write, put myself into the book. That would be too boring because I'm a boring person. I don't do many exciting things because I, I'm a workaholic, not funny at all to, to, to read about. But of course, I use myself. Of course, I use my sister a little bit. Of course, I use my wife in certain amounts. Of course, I use my neighbor over there. That's an interesting trait he's using. I'm going to put that into this guy. So to be observant and sort of interested and curious about people helps you, I would say, writing, uh, you know, constructing novels also. If it's, it's, if it's more, a, more of a, if it's a crime story or if it's a romance, feel good. If it's, a, if it's more of a literary kind of thing that files for a Nobel Prize, maybe. It's a way to use your imagination in a structured manner. Because if you're only going to invent things that doesn't exist, people who have never walked the earth, well, that, that's the ring trilogy. That's sort of Tolkien stuff or, or well, some sort of fantasy or, or science fiction. Well, that's, that's humans in there as well. Gandalf is probably based on a human being, right? Probably. Now, you, you say so, that the DISC approach is really a behavioral assessment, but, you know, I think by observing the behavior, you're able to kind of tease out motivations, right? The motivations that you're inferring are kind of what make the behavior make sense. And, you know, when you talk about management, we in business schools, we talk about extrinsic motivation and intrinsic motivation. But we sometimes talk about as if everybody is the same. <laughs> everybody has the same I intrinsic motivations. And I think, you know, part of what you're trying to do is identify different patterns of motivations that people have. And that if you're going to be a good manager, you have to learn to either, you know, understand them and tap into them. And, and behavior that you, you might find unappealing might actually be more appealing or understandable if you understand the motivations behind it. Absolutely. Motivations is even more important than behaviors because behaviors is what's on the surface. You can see the behavior. You can see how he talks, how he walks, what he says, what he doesn't say. Uh, you can't see the motivators. What I, I, I call them even drivers because motivational factors drives your actions. It drives your behaviors. And, and deeper down that you have the personality, which is somewhere beneath the surface. You know, will try to figure it out based on the behaviors, but Somebody who is, I mean, somebody who's frowning at you in a meeting doing like this, is this a good thing or a bad thing? Well, it depends. Some people say, oh, that's a bad thing. Oh, now it's really annoyed. Well, maybe if it's, if it's a red person, a dominant type, you know, task oriented, fast forward thinker, extroverted, bam, 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 you know, competitive, this is bad. But if it's an engineer, this is focus. Mm -hmm. This is concentration. So you need to understand. And they are motivated by very different things, probably. But the funny thing is you can have the same behavior profile. You know this, of course. You can have the same behavior profile and the same personality, basically, but very different motivators. Some people are theoretical thinkers. They love to learn new stuff, things they're never going to use anywhere. I am not one of those. I only read books that I find myself dragged into because, and I, I'm, I turn on this switch, but can I use this? Is this good for any, any, any reason? Is this beneficial for me? Because learning just for the fun of learning, shouldn't say that to you, obviously, but I think honesty is a good thing. But some people love to learn things. My daughter is like that. She, she reads another book and another book. I, I learned a lot about this and that and blah, blah, blah. I'm more of a practical guy. I need results. 
I'm also a little bit more individualistic. I need the power over me. I am hard to lead because I, I need to sort of be in charge of my own life, basically, on my own, in my own future, all of it. But I'm also an aesthetic, meaning I strive for harmony. I'm a very problematic person to deal with, basically, and I know that. This, this is what I had learned based on, you know, 24, starting the oh no moment, all of these things. Uh, but the funny thing with motivators, they can change within an individual also. I mean, take, let's take money. Some people are motivated by money, and I have no problem with this. But when you have built your fortune, money will not be as important as it was 10 years ago. So all of a sudden, it sort of goes down. What will pop up instead? Because you will now be motivated by something else. And it's probably not drinking margaritas on the beach. It is probably not that. But what is it? Is it philanthropy? Is it family? Is it traveling? Is it experience? What is it? It is something. And the problem for managers is to see what is this person motivated at this very moment? Because it's not necessarily the same thing on a Monday as on a Friday. This is one of the main reasons why leadership is so tough. It's so hard to actually perform really excellent leadership over time because people, they are not the same. People are sort of floating on a scale back and forth all the time. And you never know who you're going to meet. Sarah isn't Sarah two weeks back in time. It's Sarah today. What's on her mind right now? Where is her focus? Her behaviors might, again, be quite similar because behaviors and personalities don't really change when you reach, I don't know, adulthood, whenever that might be. But the motivators can change and, and their attitude can change. Of course, their opinions can change. Actually, opinions, some people change opinions. That is actually a fact. And even though people say, no, they don't, but they actually do. This is, this is fascinating. You can, I could talk for days about this. Well, I think, I mean, the net effect, I think if you had, you know, one wish that you could have realized about the people who read your books, I think it would probably be that you want them to maybe just slow down their reactions a little bit, long enough for them to try to understand the people that they're interacting with and understand their own behavior. But is the propensity to do that or the capacity to do that, I mean, is that completely orthogonal to the four categories or are, is there any one of those categories that is more yeah. capable of this type of behavior? Because when you, know, you read about the red folks, right, and they're like hard charging, they're like, oh man, it's going to be really hard to get them to slow down and, you know, pay attention to people's motivations and get to know them. It's got to be the other ones. But then, you know, when you think about the yellow people, it's like, they're so, so busy, right, trying to be liked and popular and so forth that, you know, is this skill that you're trying to teach people one that is easier to teach to certain people than others? Or do you find kind of difficult nuts to crack uh, across all of the different colors? You're not going all Simon Sinek over here, but you have to start with why. Every manager I have met, they will on an intellectual level understand what I'm talking about. I get it. I need to adapt myself to him, to her, and blah, 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 and to the team. And we, I understand, but I don't have the time. I'm really busy. You know, I'm, you know, all my time is taken already. And I say, that doesn't matter. If you're busy, I don't care about that. You ask me how to lead people in the best possible way, in the most time effective way, in the most efficient way in general. You ask me how to do that. This is how you do it. You pay attention, you close the lid in the front and you open your ears. You go green, basically. Good listeners, keeping yourself to yourself for a moment. And if you can give the red, yellow, green, and blue a good enough reason to do that, they will do it, actually, to red first. But it's, it's about selling again, Greg. You know, I had to sell this message to the red guy saying, you will achieve, you will achieve quicker results, bigger gains. You will be the winner of the year if you pay attention to these people. Listen to the team. That will make you much, much more successful. And you will get all the benefits and you will get, you know, the promotion and all of it. I said, oh, okay, I'm going to do it. That, that, that's a good reason. I totally get it, totally get it. Then I had to follow it up, you know, two hours later because they are so busy. Yellow people, as you mentioned, they are sort of busy with themselves. 
Is this looking good? Am I popular? You know, do they like me? So they will try to, you know, stay afloat by being, you know, just nice. Just this happy guy, happy-go-lucky guy, you know, that everybody loves. And I, I would say something probably like, do you know, there is a challenge here. Some people are not so pleased with you because of this and that. And that will give them some soft feedback, probably. You will gain in popularity. You will make more friends and more new acquaintances if you pay attention to this group over here. If you do that, they will listen to you and you, you will get what you need, you know, which is attention and whatever words that I might use. But that is the way I would go, actually. And some people might say, that sounds manipulative. And I would go, yes, a little bit. It's also selling. Mm -hmm. This is advanced selling. It's like selling a car or a, or, or a journey somewhere, you know, you have to convince them the best possible way. And that is to adapt the same message to different people. To a green person, I would say something like, I understand you don't like conflicts. I, I see you're struggling with all the quick changes in this organization. One way to stay away from this is to, to listen more to your staff, to adapt to them a little bit so, so they can work more by themselves based on your thorough coaching, of course, then you can be sort of more staying at your desk and not having to deal with conflicts and, and troubles and misunderstandings all the time. If you just invest these weeks, they will be more self-driven and you can sort of go back to where you were. Oh, that sounds lovely, the Greens will say. And for a blue person, I will have to bring up the facts. They are the analytical guys. They say, I understand this from an intellectual perspective. I need to pay attention, I need to speed up, I need to decide to do this and that, and I need to say it in a certain way. Where are the proofs? Uh, wh where's, the, wh where's the proof to this? How do you know it works? And then I have to give them some sort of a study, case study. I did this over here and it worked really well. Are you willing to try? Okay. So, you know, uh, it's, it's the same thing. If I can give them a reason, the quality of your work will be better than the engineer the leaders of the engineer, we, we pay attention. The scientists will pay attention if the quality increases because they are also driven by different things. The motivators vary, it's just the way it is. And you never know, you never know. You have to sort of see who they are. You need to learn their personalities and their behavior patterns. That can take a long time, actually. Can absolutely well, do. Well, they, you know, they. They say that good coaches use different techniques on different players, right? So some players, you know, it's all about positive feedback, but others it's about negative feedback. And when, you know, a player sees the coach behaving differently with a different person, they're kind of like, what's going on here? You obviously have to use different tools with different people, but does that lead to the risk of you, you know, being inauthentic, right? If you are kind of becoming different people or tapping into different aspects of, of yourself, depending on, on the context, right? I mean, you know, mm -hmm. where you are digging into your inner green, right? In, in order to react well with, with, say, a yellow person. Will I ever be myself? When is this Thomas? Can we trust him? Is he real or is he just fake? That is actually a really good question. And, and I, I think you have to be genuine in, in a way. You have to I mean, if, if you, you mentioned coaching players, if they know the rule of the game, they will buy it, into it. If they know I will treat you like this and him like that, because that's what you need. My, my field of business is to give you what you need. That means I will vary my own actions and I, you will see me treat people differently. That is only if they would observe me in, in, in my work, I would say. Uh, I have never been in a situation where one employee came up to me and said, hey, you gave him positive feedback and me negative feedback. Mm -hmm. that, that's unfair. I, I don't like you anymore. I've never been in that situation. If, you, if somebody would, would be observing me, you know, taking notes and sort of analyzing whatever I did, they would say, this is some strange chameleon. I don't trust him at all. And I could understand that notion completely. But here's the thing. I, I've experimented a lot with this. When you... It was, I think it was Maya Angelou who said it first. 
people don't necessarily remember what you said, but they will remember how you made them feel. I think that's such a beautiful statement because if I can make somebody feel good, that's what they will remember, not necessarily how I did it. Mm -hmm. Right? Makes sense? I've had students where, you know, some of them will complain that I never call on them and some will complain that I call on them all the time. One of my friends who is a former student of mine, you know, I, I was talking to him recently and he was complaining, said, you know, I raised my hand in class every day and you never called on me. And I said, yeah. And where are you now? <laughs> right. So and that that like hunger, that hunger that he had, that frustration that he had, he has channeled into some really kind of tremendous accomplishments. And we're still, you know, we're still friends. We're still good friends. That's great. That's great. That's true. I, I had, uh, I've had employees, several of them, who said, you were really hard on me. And I used to say, well, you could take it. You were <laughs> soft on him over there. You know, Roger, he never got anything. I said, yeah, he couldn't take it. He could take it. Mm -hmm. Right. That is just the way it is. Is it unfair? Sure. Maybe. I don't know. People are different. I mean, one of the biggest lies is you can be everything. You can be anything. You can do whatever you can. No, you can't. People hate to hear that. And I, I've said it on stage saying, the last week and, and I got myself a little bit in trouble with young people because their teachers said, you can be anything. And I said, they're wrong. I used myself as an example. I wanted to play basketball. Sorry, too short. Can't compete with, you know, the guys two meters tall. I just can't do it. Then I want to drive Formula One course. Sorry, too, too tall. You know, this is very unfair. Well, who am I going to blame? Our creator or, or, or nature or, you know, coincidence, I don't know. It's just that kind of planet. You have to live with people being different. Everybody can't be everything all the time. That is actually a myth. I have never believed in it. I think we have to work with what we have. We can all be excellent. We can all excel, maybe not in the field that we want to because of, of, of natural, I don't know, reasons but we can be much more than we think we can be if we put our mind to it. That is definitely the case. We can develop ourselves and work on ourselves, but we can be much, much better, bigger, faster, quicker, you know, whatever you want to call it. But we can't be anything. We can't do anything. That is actually not true. Um, and my job as a coach, as a mentor, is to make this individual as good, as successful as I possibly can. And sometimes I have to kick them in the butt technical term, sorry. And to some people, I need to be, you know, friendly and, and, and nice and polite and, and, and asking lots of questions. That is just the way it is. I don't see a problem with it, really. Well, you know, a lot of companies will create or describe or cultivate a particular style of organization, organizational culture, right? So, you know, Amazon has its organizational culture and, you know, Apple has its organizational culture. And, you know, one would think that organizations could be sorted into these colors, right? Oh, that, that's a, you know, a red organization, or that's the kind of organization where, you know, red people get ahead. But I think, you know, you had some anecdotes in the book where, you know, if you throw a bunch of red people together, <laughs> you're not going to get as much done as if you have sort of a more, you know, varied palette. But if, if the palette is varied, then, you know, what does that say about the organizational culture? I mean, don't cultures have some kind of description of what it takes to be successful within that organization. If you're the, the random green person in the red culture, are you going to, even if you're adding a lot of value, are you going to be necessarily held back because you are butting up against the norms and aspirations of that culture? I don't know. I guess it depends on what culture you have. The, the, hard, the hardest thing to describe is an existing corporate culture, I would say. I mean, what is the culture anyway? It, it, it's based on fundamental values. It based, it's based on the business idea in itself. I guess it's based on, is it more of an entrepreneurial style? Are we inventing new stuff? Are we only working on old things? Or are we trying to develop, are we inventors? Or are we, are we leaders? Are we followers? What are we really? Uh, I mean, the colors again, is just behaviors. I don't think they define the culture actually. Mm -hmm. And regardless of what culture you define, I mean, I've, I've done this, this uh, kind of work also, where you start with top management then you sort of boil it down and you make everybody uh, involved in, in understanding the culture and defining 
basic values of all of these things. And then you get 10, 10 new guys into the business and they bring other stuff in and then you have to do it all over again. I think the culture will grow and be what it is. I mean, Facebook culture, move fast and break things. Which car manufacturer would use that definition? I don't know. Not even Tesla would do that. You have to be pretty thorough and pretty patient to, to develop electrical cars that work really, you know, to put them on the grid and, you know, you have to be really, really engineering more than entrepreneurial, if that's a sort of definition. And then you need to show a lot of patience and a lot of blue behavior, definitely. And you need somebody who can sort of lead these blue nerdy types that will actually save us all at the end of the day, probably because they figured it out, basically. Uh, defining a culture, it's really, really hard. I'm not even sure it's, well, why not? stick my nose out really good here and say, I'm not sure it's really, really that important, the culture, because it is what it is. And you have so many subcultures. I mean, take Apple, Amazon, you mentioned big organizations, thousands of people, tens of thousands of people. How many subcultures do we have? On? And, and this office, there's only seven of us or 700. You can't compare them the same day. It's just the way it is. If you have good management, if you have good, solid team leaders who can make people do what they're supposed to do and feel great about it, I mean, does it matter what the culture is? I, I don't know, because we all, we have our goals, we have our objectives that we need to sort of strive towards. I mean, we're 10 people in my business. Here we can, we can keep the culture. I will never hire more than one at a time. And when I bring him or her in, I can teach them what this culture is. I will see who would, what they will bring in. If they are symbolizing things that will not fit the culture that we have, I won't hire them because I can't change them. I cannot tell them, this is how we do it in here. Well, I can tell them this is how we do it, but what you're supposed to feel and what you're supposed to think and what you're supposed to prioritize in, in, in general, in your view of the world, of the society, of the working place, I can't change that. They would have opinions, drivers, motivators. I can't change that. I can't change who they are. I can make them like me and like my business. And, and if they are competent and skilled, sure. But if they think it's a good way to leave the desk at four o'clock every afternoon, just because it's just the way it is. That is not a part of our culture. I would tell them to work a hundred hours in a row and then I, you can take two weeks off. No problem. I don't, you know, FaceTime, I don't care. Not important. But some people think it's important. I say, I, I don't want to see your face in there. I was going to see the back of your head when you are running towards the clients. You know, that's what I want to see. Well, he, he, he said, I wanted, to, I needed to take a call on a Sunday. Well, did you take the call? No, it was my free time. Well, that's not my culture. Hey. Well, guess- you can take Monday, Tuesday off if you work on a Sunday. That is our culture. If you don't like it, I totally respect it. But you're, you're not supposed to work here. You're not supposed to work more than 40 hours a week. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is you have to work when the clients needs us. That is what we do here. You can take as many hours off as you like. I have no problem with this. But we have to deliver on our promises to the market. The question is, right, is there a fit between certain types of roles and, and certain types of people? And if there is a fit, is organizational design in part about, you know, matching people with roles, right? Or matching roles with people, right? I mean, if you're designing an organization, you're recruiting people and, and then you're selecting them and organizing them into teams. And presumably that assignment of people to roles and people to teams is not, you know, arbitrary. (laughs) I mean, there's a logic to it. So, you know, when you're making those kinds of decisions, you know, how deep do you need to go into the understanding of the individual? And if there is a, a mismatch, right, to what extent can you deal with that? Either by adjusting the role to fit the person or adjusting the person to, to fit the role. Is it easier to change the role to match the person? Or is it easier to kind of change the person to match the role? Because part of what I think an underlying message of the book is, is that, you know, you can't change other people. But then it also says, but you can 
kind of change yourself, <laughs> or at least you can change your, your behaviors by understanding people better. I mean, are those inconsistent? <laughs> <laughs> the idea that you can, you no, know, improve. they're very consistent. You, you, no, you can't change anybody else. I can't change you, Greg, and you can't change me. Right. But if I could con convince you, you might start working on yourself, right? Uh -huh. But only if I give you a good enough reason. Start with why again. Again, it's a really beautiful thing. Uh, you can tell me, Thomas, if you do this and that, this is what's going to happen. Yeah, sounds good. I'm going to work on that. But I... I'm doing the changes, not you. I'm doing the change, changes. Recruitment, recruiting the right person, the right position. Oh, it's such a challenge. It, it's so hard to, to get the right people on board. That is just the case. But again, I don't think, I mean, I can, I can, I have all the necessary tools to understand who is this. I had the disc profile. I, I have several uh, assessments that I can use and I can find intrinsic values, ex ex extrinsic values. I can see more of it. I, 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 I can dig into it. I can go down to the ground more in each. I can find out probably 98% of each and every individual that, that uh, comes along. I don't have a dream profile. I have to plot him in somewhere over here. That's the perfect guy. I don't have that. I still go by gut feeling a lot, even though I have all the data. I will have so many things to analyze. I still will look you in your eyes and see, would you like to work here and why? And if you say something that, I, that, that makes me believe you, you're hired. You have to be skilled and you have to certain competences, obviously, but that goes without saying. But when it comes to, you have three people with the same background, the same, same resume, basically. You have to make some choices here. So I will go with gut feeling then. And still, gut feeling is highly underrated. And scientists, they hate it. Gut feeling, you need to prove everything. Well, maybe. If you've been around, you know what to look for. I know how to make people lie and straight into my face. I know how to make them try to look as good as possible. I know how to sort of shoot arrows into any balloon they would send up there because that's my profession. I'm most interested in people who will say something and deliver exactly what they told me. They should deliver it. The difference between what you say and what you do for me is the most crucial point in any process, really. When it comes to recruiting new staff members, when it comes to finding business partners, when it comes to finding investors or whatever, could be anything. That is why my wife and I, I go, go along so well, because relationships matter regardless of where you are. Because I've been married twice before, and so has she. So we were sort of no more dating, you know, no more relations. I'm going to be by myself and get away from it, you know. But we figured out we are actually the type of people who will say something and then do it, which we annoy a lot of other people. I'm not saying it's a good thing, but I value this more than anything else. That is more important if you are trustworthy than if you are skilled or competent, because I can teach you. I can put you... You know, I can send you to class and, and, and so you can learn this and that and whatever. But I can't change your mindset when it comes to, to, to what's important. I can't change your personality. Again, I can't change your values or, or what you prioritize in your, in your general life. But I can, I can teach you new things. If you have the right way of looking at partnership or, or, or what it's been, what it is like to be working here in my office, and you have this persona with you, even though you might say, I would like to suggest some changes. Well, good. If you are the right person, well, come on board. But it's not hard to find out who that is. Some people will say so many stupid stuff in an, in an interview. And again, my job is to sort of check if it's true. I said, could you give me, I, I, I work really hard. You know, I'm so excited. I, I'm, I'm so engaged, you know. They had to send me home, you know, and say, go home, you shouldn't be working anymore. You know, I said, that sounds fantastic. You do have an example, but they haven't made the story up good enough. So they don't have any proper examples. So they start, start to think out loud, you know, well, it was this one time, you know, and when the eyes are going up here, I start to fantasizing and imagining things. I say, I'm sorry, you're not the guy for us. It comes from practice, I would say. Probably recruited thousands of people in my in my career. Probably, 
was I did this for a living also as a consultant. So I've seen probably, maybe not all of it, but most all of it, I would say. And it's, uh, yeah. So the book Surrounded by Idiots has got a whole bunch of sequels. <laughs> Bad bosses, psychopaths, narcissists, yeah, and now this new one, Time Vampires. But do you think that the sequels are different in some fundamental way from the first book? Because it seemed like the first book was really, it was built on it empathy, right? Understanding that maybe these people aren't idiots after all. But in the other books, I mean, you, you really do identify some character traits that, you know, are, you know, empathy is only going to get you so far, right? I mean, with the narcissist and the psychopaths, and, I mean, those are people that, would they also benefit from better self-understanding or are they kind of beyond the pale or if you really are truly a psychopath and narcissist, do you have even a a desire to understand oneself or would you just then look at these tools as additional tools for manipulation or for self aggrandizement or career advancement? And I'm waiting also for the surrounded by Machiavellian so you can complete the entire dark triad, right? That'll be your next book. Yeah. As you probably know, Greg, there's a, there's a fourth character in the dark triad now. The sadist. Ah, okay. No, I, I, People say they're, they're, there's really four of them, really, you know, uh-huh. sometimes. And if you have a sadistic psychopath, then you're in trouble. I mean, this is, I guess, the, the plethora of toxic people, let's say. Uh, psychopaths, narcissists, Machiavellians, of course, sure. And energy vampires, which could be, you know, any of these. Uh, and, and it could be drama queens, could be passive, aggressive people, could be, you know, control freaks, could be anything, really. When it comes to psychopaths and narcissists, they stand out in the crowd in a specific way. They can't change their behaviors because they are born this way. You have narcissists that turned narcissistic based on nurture more than nature. But you have clinical narcissists and clinical psychopaths, which you can see on brain scans, the amygdala, which controls flight or fright, for instance. It does more than that, but in, in this case, they don't feel stress. They don't get scared. You know, they're excellent in combat probably because they are really, you know, they are really focused, even though, you know, someone's shooting at them, they can really see what they have to do. So you can use them if you put them in the right place. I usually say the most famous psychopath in the world is probably James Bond, I would say. He's charming and lovely and witty, you know, and, you know, he's, he has his ways with women, you know, and he, but he's also a serial killer. A quite manipulative guy, right? He's a liar. I mean, he's, he's everything, but he, he's on our side, so we like him, right? <laughs> And you can also take Joseph Stalin or Mao or, or, or you know, Hitler or the, these kind of guys. I think you said but Churchill has some of these attributes too, right? Churchill had them as well. Yes, that is true. That is true. That is true. I usually don't go into modern politics because that would probably put me in, get me in trouble. But you, 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 know, you need find a much, them in... need a in, much longer book. I need a much longer book. There's been, been done assessments on, on a lot of American presidents, really. And the guy at the top is not the one you you, was, you would suspect. It's not the one you would expect to be up there. Mm-hmm. And that's certainly a family, right? But they are born like this. They are born like it. They won't change. They will. In Sweden, we tried to give the psychopaths a therapy in the early 70s. They had to stop doing that because it only taught psychopaths more tools, as you said, more ways to manipulate people. You know, when you do this, she would feel bad. Oh, that's really low. That's interesting. I'm going to take these notes, you know. So they, they got worse. You can't teach them anything. They can change and they can play. They can act. They can be like some sort of chameleons themselves, but they have this really, really toxic slash dangerous persona uh, at the bottom of their heart. And they don't care about you. They don't care about you. And you are just a expendable asset for them. That is what you are. That was, that is what I am. They don't care. They can play like they care. They can try to look like they care, but they don't. And when I talk about this, when I give lectures on psychopathy, people come up to me and say, that sounded kind of serious. You know, are are you sure about this? Yeah, but it is serious. It sounds kind of, I don't know. Well, it is, that is exactly what it is. Being naive about psychopathy, that that's, that's not a virtue. 
that's a curse. It's going to put you in trouble. Uh, I've been a victim for psychopathy myself. My wife also. She was the one who said, uh, you should write about psychopaths because of this and that. And I fell straight back, backwards into manipulation, all the techniques they use. And I realized, oh my God, this is really, this is horrible. This is really, really bad. And I lost a lot of my naivety when I learned about manipulation techniques and psychopathy and, and where their aims really are. I lost a bit of my belief in, in human nature, but still two, three, four percent of the population, depending on who you're asking, are clinical psychopaths, which is quite a lot of people, actually. It's the reason that we go for 200,000 people in, in the lower range. In, in the States, it would be, I don't know, how many are you? Two percent. That's a lot of this millions, you know. And, and some of them are in senior positions in organizations. I know of at least one in my organization. And yet the question is, how do they succeed in ad advancing through their career? I mean, it's not because everyone's like, oh, yeah, there's the psychopath. Let's promote him. You know, <laughs> is it because people don't realize until it's too late? Or is it that there are a certain subset of people, usually bosses of psychopaths that have sort of a blind spot, right? Where they, they never figure it out. Well, the higher up in the hierarchy, the more, the, the more psychopaths on average you will meet. That is just the way it is. In society in general, let's say 2%, just to, not to exaggerate anything. And when it comes to managers, CEOs, 10%, politicians, even more. Top management, regardless of what you call top positions, Presidents, uh, chairman of the boards, uh, CEOs, uh, it could be, you know, mafia leaders, obviously. <laughs> uh, but also in media, you find a lot of them, actually. You find them when it comes to acting. Anything that will give attention, because they are attention seekers. Why do they survive? Well, they usually move around quite a lot. They usually don't stay in the same place for very many years, because at the end of the day, they will be relieved as their true selves. But they are also good at hiding in plain sight because they get so close to you and they, again, they are excellent manipulators and they are good actors. They can, it's easier to fool a man than to convince him that he has been fooled. Mm -hmm. And that is how they can sort of use ourselves as a prey. You know, he kind of tricked you there, you know, no, we didn't. You will say, no, 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 I, I'm fully aware of what's happening here. <laughs> so, oh, where are you really? And they get favorites. They build their own gang, you know, they build their own team. They will get, give a lot of focus to some people who will protect them. It's called pawns, you know, in this psychology, useful pawns who will sort of line up in front of the psychopath and take everything out, you know, as good as they can. Uh, well, I can talk for hours about this, but. The question that always pops up is, how do I recognize a psychopath? You have to pay attention for maybe several months in a row because you have to look for certain patterns. Everybody can have a bad day. Everybody can say one thing and do another thing once in a while. I do that too, so I'm no better than anybody else. But they do it all the time. You have to really, really pay attention to what they are saying and what they are doing. You have to really pay attention to reveal all the lies that will be there. And you can't do that, you know, just over, over a fortnight. You have to, over two, two weeks time, you maybe have to spend months and months and months to just figure it out. But the most important thing to look for when it comes to yourself, not that you ask, but I'm going to tell you anyway, if it feels bad, it is bad because your emotions don't lie. Maybe you don't know why you feel bad when you're around this person or that person. But if it feels bad, it is bad, and maybe you should listen to that. Maybe try to observe, why do I feel bad when I'm working together with him? What is it that he's doing that makes me feel like this? Maybe that's the only answer you need for now. And maybe then you should go look for something else to do, because they will never change. They will never change. The best possible advice, and everybody in the field says the same thing, walk away. You have to walk away. If you feel threatened by a psychopath, you have to walk away, even if you are married to him. And I say him because they are mostly men. There are female psychopaths also, 
but one out of four is a female probably, but you have to walk away for well, your own good. You, you just have to. When I talk to students that went to business school, you know, 10, 20 years ago, they almost always say, I, I wish I'd spent more time learning what they call soft skills, you know, learning more about people. And I wish I'd spent less time mm-hmm. learning, you know, finance and statistics and so forth. Why is it that people underestimate the degree to which understanding others and understanding themselves will help them not only achieve their goals, but to, you know, become better people and better managers and better colleagues, right? I mean, is there something Mm -hmm. systematic about the way we think that leads us to kind of overemphasize these things we call hard skills and kind of downplay the importance of understanding other people? That's a great question. I, I, I have a theory. I'm going to give it to you, I, but I, be aware, it's a theory. It's based on my own experiences. And I can't say how true it really is and how close to the truth it really is. I mean, look at STEM fields, hard skills, mostly male-driven. When we look at statistics and you look at, at behavioral assessments like the DISC or the Big Five Theory or MBTI, they all say the same thing, that women and men focuses a little bit differently. The overlap is huge, but there are some differences, some differences. Some people don't like to talk about these things, but statistic is statistics. If it's true in reality, but based on what we can see in these numbers, men are tilted towards things, you know, tasks. Women are a little bit more tilted towards people, humans, relationships, let's say. The more male-dominant industry is, the less interest in behaviors, soft skills, people skills, all of these things. It's a theory. Again, I can't prove it. I'm not advocating it's a good thing. I can only base it on my own observations and my own experiences. And a lot of data when it comes to all these tools that are so, that's how there's tens of millions of profiles that tells us this. Is it because of the environment they are working in? Is it because this old thing, nature versus nurture? Why is it? I don't know why it is like this. I'm not even sure it's a good thing. There are differences. And I think we guys tend a little bit more often than women. Again, the overlap is huge, but we can spot some differences, some differences. Maybe we tend to forget about it more than, than, than the ladies do. Uh, women seem to pay a little bit more attention to how are you? Are you okay? Could I help you with something? Or as always, it's at, at the end of the, the distribution where you can see the differences, the least people interested persons are all male. The most interested, uh, people interested persons are mostly female. And I say mostly because it's never all true, but, but still, when it comes to business, when it comes to, you know, my ex, my previous uh, industry of banking, there were some trainings when it came to, to, to how to lead people, but it was more like writing business plans, you know, and uh, time efficiency, all this stuff. Mm -hmm. It was never about how to lead a red person versus leading a green person, which would be totally opposites. They never mentioned any or, or in any other kind of language, let's say. They just said, you know, the new newcomers, they don't know anything. You have to train them, you know, and you have to whip them a little bit. You have to give them hard feedback and blah, blah, blah. Uh, well, that is true to some extent, I guess. You have to be sort of thorough with them, you know, a firm hand, you know, and guide them really into to the, the, their field of business. But then again, people are different, different motivators, different drivers, different personalities. So you can't treat everybody the same thing. That's, that's the stupidest idea. This is who they are. What, one thing that I really, really have a problem with is this Gen Z question, this Gen Z issue. Gen Zs are depressed, you know, they're lazy, they have no, they have no direction. They don't show any interest in anything, you know, they are just blah, 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 blah. This really, really frustrates me because with some of them probably are. But I'm a Gen X, you know, I have a really lousy work ethic. I'm considered sort of a cynical slacker myself because of my, my non-present parents, which it it doesn't make any sense. And Gen Z are 2.43 billion people. 
for me, it's complete stupidity when I see huge, these largest think tanks on the planet saying, this is who they are and this is how you have to lead them. Well, maybe, or maybe you just shouldn't put up all these self-fulfilling prophecies out there. You have to go on an individual level. You just have to. If you forget about the soft skills, you're going to get yourself in trouble because you will need other people throughout your life to cooperate with. And I know you know this, but to anybody who's listening, you will never make it on your own. I'm a self-made man. No, you're not. You didn't do it completely on your own. Maybe you're the, the strongest driver in your life, sure, but you didn't make it on your own. That is actually not true. You use a lot of other people. And if you know the best possible way and to motivate them and to make them bring them on board in the best possible way, that is what you're going to need. You can learn any skill from a YouTube channel or a book or take a class at your university. Of course, people skills, that's the magic. Why do we forget about it? Is it us guys? Do we just think, if I'm an engineer, I have it all down? No, I don't. What's your theory? I, you know, it's, it's a good one. I, I'm still puzzled by it, but I have to argue that I have to admit that I fell prey to it myself, right? It took me a long time to realize how important it is to understand others. Uh, last question. You're very unapologetic in all your books when you describe yourself. You know, you say, okay, I got this red. I've got this, you know, yellow. I've got some blue and no green. Sorry about that. Not happening for me. Have you ever thought that it might be a good idea for you to go to, I don't know, green camp or, you know, green training or, you know, maybe because there's always this big debate about whether you should lean into your strengths or whether you should try to kind of, you know, alleviate some of your weaknesses. I mean, do you see... And of course, that yeah. I'm not saying, you know, that's a weakness to, you know, to be, Ouch. because then everybody has that a weakness. But it, is there any, yeah. would there be any value to you kind of going to green camp and, you know, improving your, your green skills? I hear I actually have a prepared answer because this question I get a lot. You, 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 you have so little green in you. You have to be a really poor listener and nobody likes you and you don't like anybody else. Either. So, so what, what, what's, what's the matter with you? Well, the thing is this, I know about this weakness. Of course, it's a weakness. I mean, there's other tools, so build on your strengths, find your strengths, build on those, skip everything else. Well, that's also a kind of silly notion, don't you think? Because then you will never develop things that you might be needing in the future. Of course, you have to work on things that you're really lousy at. Of course, you have to do that. And I know on a hundred percent scale, I have 2% uh, 2% green. That is not a lot. And I'm not ashamed of it because I didn't build me. Nature did or my parents did or whoever I should blame. I don't know why I am like this, but I do know I am lacking certain green natural traits, which means I have to practice them a lot, which I have. So I can turn that switch on like this. And a lot of people would interpret me as only green if I put my mind to that mm-hmm. in coaching. I can be completely silent and only open my ears and take in notes and, and bring everybody in, bring everybody in and, and never ever say anything, which is a green trait, you know, and never use myself as an example, only ask questions and build on other kinds of experience. I know how to do it, but then I have to go back to being me. Such as a green person can learn how to, to be more dominant, a little bit more aggressive if, if, if needed but he has to go back to be him. That is kind of what you need to do. You need to adapt to the situation, but you will only do it again, back to the question of self-awareness 45 minutes ago. If you don't know that you are lacking the green, then you're in trouble because you never know when to turn on the green switch or go to green camp. I've been to green camp. In the beginning, it irritated me a lot but I understood I need to, to, to make this work. Otherwise, I will not be a good coach or a good mentor. I need to learn this too. So I did. But in full freedom, I won't be green. That is just the way it is. And I have accepted it. I've tried to be, yay, whoa, with everybody else and make, make friends with everybody, everybody in the family, and even down to the, to the dog, you know. I just can't do it. It's not me. That would be a lie. Well, I can see your next line of business on the horizon. You could come up with a series of gyms. People could go and 
exercise their green muscles and their blue muscles like they do now with their abs and, and their lats and so forth. Yeah. Thanks so much for joining me. Classic surrounded by idiots and of course a whole bunch of other ones surrounded by psychopaths, surrounded by bad bosses. You can pretty much start anywhere because within each of these books, you do provide a summary of the basics of the framework outlined in Surrounded by Idiots. So thanks so much, Thomas, for joining me. Thank you so much. It was a pleasure. Thank you. This is Unsilo brought to you by Alumni FM, connecting people through stories. 